history. There were probably six or 800 women who had come out of these three different schools. Cornell was also a good school. People say we didn't have women, but in fact, Mrs. Shipman's first uh, assistant was Elizabeth Leonard Strang, who was our first graduate at Cornell in 1910. Ezra said, Ezra Cornell, when he founded my school, said, everybody's going to come here. Of course, he put it up on the hill. There were only you know, rooms for men. <laughs> And the ladies had to walk up and down the hill between classes. They couldn't even stay up there between classes. So, I mean, you know, it was sort of a joke. The first woman was there for a week and said, forget it. Because if you've ever met the of the hill. All right. On the left is Mrs. Shipman. She's already in her office in New York, so she's probably in her mid-50s. In 1933, poor Mrs. Shipman, this was a drawing of her. This was a group of women in, in House and Garden's own Hall of Fame. And these were important landscape architects of the time. I'm not going to say much about them. Uh, it's a group you might want to know. Louise Payson actually worked in her office. Romney Spring did. Uh, Agnes Sells Clerk, who married Cameron Clark, the architect, also worked in Mrs. Shepard's office. But as you'll see, she was called Dean of American Land Women Landscape Architects. So even by 1930, this was in the Depression, she was seen as a very, very important person in landscape architecture. As I said, one of the important things, uh -huh, let's see if that works. Hang on. They told me this would work. Back. See, this is tough. This is really, John, you got to work on this. Okay. Uh, color was important. These are two photos of these painted slides. The garden on the left is the Abbey Rockefeller Garden up in Maine. Uh, this was done by Beatrix Ferran. This garden, I don't even know whose it is, but I show these to show you what women really excelled at. The, the borders were their famous sort of uh, sign that they used, many of these wide borders for pathways, but also the use of colors. And while I don't want to stress color so much, and I'll make that point in a minute, I think it's interesting how women use color differently. On the left, we get the idea it's almost an impressionistic type of use, where colors blended with one another. That's very much the Gertrude Gico, Beatrix Ferran style. Their sense was all the colors flowed in. There would often be lavenders, whites, and pinks. While this is not Mrs. Shipman's garden, it's certainly the way she would have designed. The reason I say that, she often used colors. Uh, Judas said like a stained glass window, where different colors very, uh, you know, are very vivid next to each other. And she would often have what I call queen for a day or queen for a week. She would only use maybe six or eight flowering plants in an entire perennial bed. And one of these, groups, whatever it is, would be the queen for a week or two. It would be blooming, and then it would die back. And here you see this sort of yellow iris that reappears three or four times in this garden. This would have been more typical of how Shipman highlighted color uses in her garden, unlike some other of the women, as this one to our right. I want to see if this will do it. Aha! Again, on the left, we see more of a Gertrude Chico, Beatrix Ferran kind of garden. Uh, on the right, more of a Shipman garden because she would have used whites. Yellow was not her favorite color, but I show you this because these are really the hallmark of women designers, these beautiful borders, lots of flowers, very subtle understanding of color when color was appropriate. Uh, again, I show you the one on the left also. You can begin to understand some of the quality of these slides. While they're very beautiful and nice, if one were going to try to do a subtle uh, color analysis of that photo, it would be very, very difficult. And the other unfortunate thing is many of the particular hybrids that these women knew and used have long since disappeared. Better hybrids, different hybrids. And so the color combinations they worked so hard to attain are almost unattainable or uh, unfathomable for us at this point in time. Okay. Uh, one thing that Mrs. Shipman talked about that I really appreciate is the fact that by colors important, the most important color in the garden is because it's there all year. And there are lots of different shades of green. And so this is a garden that's actually in its sort of latter days, but it was an important um, Shipman garden. It's down in Winston-Salem. It was the DeWitt Haynes. This is of Haynes uh, underwear. Mr. and Mrs. Ralph uh, Haynes, and DeWitt was the wife. Uh, she passed away in the late 80s, was actually living here, and it's now become the home of the Wake Forest President College. But anyway, this is the garden, and the reason I enjoy it is because it has a lot of the character of, this is uh, the connection to the house, looking down to the garden, but you begin to see 
lots of different greens. Even if this has no color in it, it's exciting because of the greens and the variety of greens and texture, which we'll talk about in a minute. But Mr. Shipman made a point of that. Color is important, but color is very ephemeral. It comes and goes. It's not there more than two or three weeks of the year at most. But things like texture and colors of green are extremely important. And so she focused on it. This, is a, this could be a gross point joke here. And I say this with good intention. This is about a three and a half story house. And the Whit Haynes didn't want to look too ostentatious. And so they want to make it look like a cottage. All of these bricks are three times as large as you want them. So when you're standing down the road, the house looks like this little story and a half cottage. And it's only when you get there you realize that these bricks are huge. It's a real play with the eye in terms of the understanding of the quality of that house. And this I like particularly because, again, it shows you the idea that green is the critical color. Green is really the most important color. So why color, all kinds of colors were important, green is the ultimate one. And there were some colors Mrs. Shipman didn't like. And I think Judith will talk about. Oranges were not her favorite. Uh, salmons were tough because they didn't do well with a lot of combinations. There were certain blues that she really struggled to get in those. So it's an interesting kind of uh, discussion of color. I mean, she was very, very, again, she was the, uh, the ultimate connoisseur of design. She would not serve peach ice cream on a raspberry plate. I mean, she knew they clashed. You know, she just, that kind of subtle thing. So it wasn't that she didn't know it. She just said that maybe people get too interested or excited about color when they need to realize other things are always present in a garden. Secondly, texture. Now, these are photos of Shippen Gardens. This is the Croft Garden uh, down in Chestnut Hills. Again, uh, interestingly, a lot of women were taking photos of gardens, and I think uh, Judith does a nice discussion of that. These are by a woman named Maddie Edwards Hewitt. Uh, Maddie took these, again, you see they're not bright color, but I actually liked them better because we began to see the way that Mrs. Shipman used textures. And Judith talks about this really interestingly, that she was very, uh, well, she was very brave. She would actually go where no one else would go in terms of very fine and very coarse textures. Generally, people thought about using sort of a, a kind of graduation of textures from very fine, very coarse, that way. But Mrs. Shipman would throw things together in very unusual and uh, subtle combinations that were quite uh, unique for the time. And people seeing these textures often didn't realize sort of the dynamics of the garden as one actually looked at it. So she was quite uh, innovative in the way she put gardens together. Backwards, this is, hang on. And finally, she said, not only texture and color, but dark and light. Shadows are probably the most critical thing in a garden. And this is when you would see this, and usually I show this first, and then people go, ooh, look what it looked like you know, afterwards. She would talk about going out in the morning or garden and say, oh, these are gone. I've got to get rid of these. She would go out later in the evening and say, how could I ever have thought of taking those out? Because the light was different. The shadows were different. The kind of textural quality that that light and shadow play gave to the garden. So she saw the color green, the idea of textures, and finally the way dark and light played in a garden as being more critical than actual colors that we think of in terms of the color wheel, even though she was an expert with that. So we want to think about that as we look at some of the uh, Gross Point Gardens. These are two images which sort of bring that together. I think it's nice as we look at the different textures, we get a sense of how, again, with no color, no green, we can still see the wonderful quality of the variety of textures, both uh, plant and, I think, in terms of the material she used in steps. Also, she did a wonderful thing in terms of using darks and lights. She would often have light, and area, well here it's dark, area of light, then it would get dark, and then there would be light. And so even in the smallest garden, you were visually drawn to the farthest corners of the space because of that play on dark, light, dark, light. And so she used the sense of darkness and lightness to encourage people to circulate and move around a space. So again, it was a strategy in terms of design 
But even the visual quality is absolutely wonderful the way one looks at that, sees it. And one more, dark and light. Now, I don't want you to think that she didn't use color at all. And this is a really interesting uh, garden, one of the first she did on her own. It's the Julia Fish Garden in Greenport, Long Island. Again, the plan is out here. So this looks pretty big. The plan was fairly small. Um, a couple things about the plan. I have to digress. It's always a big deal, you know, that I keep going on. This is not Mrs. Shipman's drawing. She never got this good. I'll be honest. She couldn't draw that well. I have a couple of her drawings for gross points. She did the Stevens Gardens in her own hand. It's nice, but not great. This was done by Elizabeth Leonard Strang. This is the kind of drawing skills that were being taught to young women and men in architecture and landscape architecture programs. A couple things interesting and sort of very formal. This is ink on linen. You'll see a lot of gray drawings. That's a linen, a kind of a reproducible, but, but fairly thick. And then there's also sort of a yellow linen you'll see out here. And finally, what we call trace, a very thin, almost transparent. So there's a whole level of the quality of the drawing paper. This is on that linen. But what's interesting is the way that they actually laid out the garden. This was a very long, and as Judith noticed, really, it was out in the middle of a field. It was a very barren site. And as I understand the story, and whether it's true or not, it's good press, so just believe me. <laughs> there was a rose garden here, so I assume that Miss Fish somehow owned a property in here and had a rose garden. This is almost 400 feet long, almost, well, it's a football field. A long, narrow piece, and as I understand it, you could view a Long Island Sound out here. And her charge to Miss Shipman was, how can I have a garden that will draw people all the way from my rose garden all the way down to the pergola, which overlooks the sound, and then back? And it's only about 50 feet wide, very narrow, like an alley she purchased. Well, Mrs. Shipman did it very subtly. She said, what would look best behind roses? Because many of these things are seen in layers, and you don't want to have clashing layers as you view one thing against another. So we have this rose garden. Could be a lot of colors. Behind that, she puts lavender flowers, thinking that a lavender garden would be soft, sort of muted, would not clash with the roses. Next, we go to pink, because next to lavender, pink would look great. Then we go to a blue garden, and the blue is really at the center, around water, pool, a little bit of a bubbler. Next, we go from the blue into the mixed garden, the one that has lots of color, reds and some yellows, just really bright, because from down here, all of these subtle colors would bring you to that brightest area. And then, what's the garden behind that? The white garden, because the white garden would actually accentuate those beautiful colors of the mixed garden. So here we have this wonderful progression of colors that actually bring one again down through the garden and enable you to get all the way down to the pergola. Secondly, we can begin to see also her articulation of rooms. These are big old junipers. They also give a sense of progression and spatial sequence as you move along this trail. And you'll see that as you see these views. Really very nice. Here we are, the first one, and you begin to see light, dark, light, dark. You can see the rooms, real, literally, as they pop down. I don't know what colors they are, but you could see how your eye, if this were the lavender, pink, blue, you couldn't even see yet that mixed garden. So you see how the colors would bring you down. And again, this is the uh, little pool. Look at the ivy here. I want you to think of the ivy in a minute. You see how it's not all the way around. It's just sort of stuck here. And there's the pergola. Again, you see the rooms going down. So a very subtle way, very difficult sight, but she's done, I think, a really ex you know, incredible uh, way of designing this. Excuse me, I'm going to see. Do you guys know what time you have to go home? This is what I ask my students. They get up and leave, you see. It's almost 8.30. It can't be. Woo! We're going to have to move right along here. We're not even to Gross Point. No wonder people are leaving. OK, I'm going to shut up. We don't have much at Gross Point. All right, another thing I should talk about that I think Judith does a pretty good job with, but this is one of the things I hope to explore more. <coughs> this is a Charles Adams plant garden, Faulkner Farm of Brookline. Charles Adams Platt, as you know, is very much a traditional uh, designer. Uh, Judith has uh, good information about him. Charles Morgan's also written a good book about Charles Adams Platt. Artist is architect, I believe. Started out as a lithograph, inker, and then he became a landscape painter. And finally, he was doing gardens, and then he realized people weren't making gardens, that, houses that fit his garden, so he started designing houses. So he ended up being the consummate everything. 
He's the one with whom Mrs. Shipman began uh, working in Cornish in 1910. Anyway, this is a, a, a flat drawing, and I show this because you see how architectural it was. Very classical, we would say. Very regular, uh, very clear articulation of garden and house. Again, large panels here. Very clear relationships. And that's what Mrs. Shipman used. She was not, uh, she did not vary from that very much. Some of her gardens are very classical, and I say that in an also formal might be the word. But what made her gardens and other gardens of the period different, I think are clearly shown in this illustration. This is another drawing by Platt, Maxwell Court in Connecticut. This is a Samuel Salvage estate, one of the largest estates that Mrs. Shipman did. This was out on Long Island called Rinwood, uh, a huge estate. She did the entire design. I think this was done in 24. Look at the articulation of the plan. Where he has garden pieces, he shows landscape as geometry. Does everybody see that? Very clear. This is Mrs. Shipman. She has the landscape as geometry, and then look at the way she plants. It's absolutely irregular. And that's what she wrote about. She said, I take these formal geometries and explode them with my plantings. So she broke up these very formal architectural pieces with these very unusual way of planting, which is just wonderful. Whether it's these huge uh, rows of plants that hang over the uh, paths as one through, or whether it's something as simple as this, this very formal piece, and then look at the way she pops that one little tree in there. I remember we just talked about Julia Fish. They had the pool in the middle. Rather than put ivy all the way around in this perfect, she just plops some on one end. Breaking up the formality of these with this very lush sort of over planting, so all of the geometries become sort of an underlying, almost hidden element of what really would be a very formal design if one understood completely. Again, uh, I find this fun. I pulled this out. I think this is in 1920, November 29, right in front of me. House and Garden. It talks about a modernist garden has appeared in the United States. This was not Mrs. Shipman's. This was on Long Island. And why was it modern? Well, there was a concrete wall, walk. These were metal plates, and they had uh, solid geometric forms of color for plantings. And at the end, they had this wonderful little plinth, concrete. And guess what was in the plinth that made it modern? A radio. So you could play a radio in the garden. So that was a modern garden. This, for the older style, was Mrs. Shipman's garden. And so she was seen as a very traditional gardener. Uh, garden designer. And I think that's important because it's much like Charles Adams Platt. People hired him for the architect because they knew what to expect. He was a traditional designer, and even though he would do a house specific for your site, for your needs, you knew what you were getting when you were getting a Platt house. The same way with Mrs. Shipman. While she would be very specific, the site was always important. She would design it just for you and your needs and your personality. You knew what you were getting when you got a Shipman garden. And so I think that's, that's important. People have seen that as negative. I see it as a real point of almost salesmanship on her end because she had to make a living. The woman was without support. She had three children. She was divorced. And so she did in, uh, didn't go out on a limb, I want to say. She did not do a lot of innovative, modern things simply because that was not her interest, nor was it really what she was able to do in terms of her financial ability to support herself. So is she a great modernist? I don't think so. But she was certainly a very good uh, traditional garden designer. OK, we're going to move faster. I apologize. I always talk too much. The bell will ring here, and then you can go. So don't worry about it. Charles Adams Platt was her mentor. Uh, they did some projects together. I'm going to show you this one quickly. It's the Prin Garden. Pruin or Prin? Does anybody know? I've asked that. P-R-U-Y-N. You want to say Pruin, but I've heard people say, oh, that's Prin. So whatever, these were two uh, single ladies who had their cottage updated in 1916 on Long Island. Mrs. Shipman did what she called a colonial revival garden. And what's fun, again, a very simple garden extending from the house, beautiful little seat, again, enclosed. She always was talking about privacy. A garden's a place to get away, to be by yourself, to shut out the world. So we have this very nice hedge. And then we have this very lush planting. Again, this is very young. Uh, her only experience has been working for Charles Adams Platt and 15 years in her own garden, which she said was incredibly uh, a learning experience for her. That's really where she learned about plants, was doing her own garden. But it's a very simple little garden, but it shows you some of the things that she began to do. Pathways, lush plantings, 
and lo and behold, things got publicized. So it was important that her gardens were recorded and published in newspapers. This, I'm not sure what magazine this is, but it's called The Garden in Good Taste. And this, again, was a Shipman garden published probably about 1917 or 18. Now, I was going to do a whole thing about the Garden Club of America because that's probably the other way that Mrs. Shipman uh, got her clients. But we'll talk about that in a minute with Gross Point. This is another one very quickly. This was, uh, you see, this isn't quite a nice drawing. You see that? This is Miss Shipman. She never got much over that, but who cares? And you're making money, you can hire people, you know. But this is her drawing for Samuel Morris down in Chestnut Hill. Again, she's still in, in Cornish. I think this is 1918. What's funny is you see things that she does. These are little rose pieces that aren't, when you see them, they don't look too bad, but they look fussy. We're going to see those again show up in Dr. Murphy's. So notice them. Again, she did this incredible uh, perennial garden with an open space with a pool. Notice the irregular planting. But even more, you see, this is a very formal layout. But as you look at it, you see the way the plantings begin to really destroy the whole sense of formality there. There's simply no sense that this plan has been replicated in that image. And it's that kind of wonderful ability to sort of hide the bones or skeleton of a design that she does. This is that perennial garden we saw, and look at the plantings. And again, this is her forte. She and other women knew their plants incredible plants. And this is perennial planting, uh, perennial planting, often any design, and I don't know, the Dillmans may have had 20 different planting plants. It would be spring bulbs, summer bulbs, fall bulbs, spring blooming shrubs, fall blooming shrubs, standard plants, potted plants, incredible knowledge. And you can see how these all had identified in them. And I must say, people would say, well, was she an environmentally uh, conscious designer? No. By that I mean, People, and I hope I don't think, people like you don't want a garden five years from now. You want it yesterday. And so invariably people would say, plant that garden, overplant that garden, and you rip them out next year if they get too low. So she would overplant gardens early on for new gardens, and then you would intend to rip them out to maintain them because people wanted immediacy. And that was very clear with her clientele, who were very uh, well to do, obviously. Okay, I think we're at gross point. It's a black hole. No, no. <laughs> we're going to go through here. As I said, uh, as I looked at gross point, and I, if somebody could read my, I, I don't know if I have a, I had a list here. I don't know if it's worth it. I um, had no way of knowing how to do them. So I thought what I would do is just go through chronologically the, the, the gardens I have. Um, it's, it's interesting and telling. As I said, the garden club is very important. Uh, you are one of the original founders of the Garden Club. You probably know that. I think 1913 I had to read history because I do get confused with the Garden Club. I believe it began in 1904 in Philadelphia and then there was a general call in 1913 to other clubs. The Garden Club of Michigan was one of the founding members and even though that wasn't Gross Point, uh, I think over half of the members of the Garden Club of Michigan were from Gross Point. And I know Mrs. John Newberry became one of the heads of the Garden Club of America about 1917 or 18. So you were a very active early club, and Mrs. Shipman was actually in there. How did Mrs. Shipman get involved in Gross Point? Uh, my sense is that, as you know, Charles Adams Platt designed the original moorings. This is the original Alger home, which is now the War Memorial, in 1910. And that was the year that Mrs. Shipman began working for Charles Adams Platt. And she began to do most of his gardens, that's why he hired her, and by 1912-14 she was doing all of his gardens. So it's my understanding that this was her first connection to uh, Gross Point. Now she also did the Henry Stevens garden. Henry or William, who's the father? Henry? I'll have to get my light bulb. You folks don't know your history, see? I don't. That's what I, you can't expect me to know all of Gross Point. Come on, we got to get over this. Um, anyway. John really needs to get his services update here to tell that they got this and that. All right. Um, yeah, Henry, Henry Stevens, uh, she did a garden in 1917. We'll look at it in a minute. Platt did their house in 1913. So you have two Platt homes going up in the Gross Point area. I think Stevens were actually in Detroit at that time. 1910 at the Algiers, 1913 the Stevens. Mrs. Shipman did the gardens for both. So obviously she was already involved very early on. And then she was doing gardens here until she closed her office in 1947. Now, the Algiers are a good case in point about confusion. 
I assume this is pre-war memorial garden, because obviously the auditorium isn't here. This is the loge, and you can actually look out over the garden out at Lake St. Clair at the point. I think the Knott Garden was there prior to the War Memorial. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this would have been a plan to that. See the loge up there? Again, she did an incredible number of these. If people are interested in Knott Garden study, you should look. She has sheets and sheets and sheets of the drawings and the measurements of all of these different forms. I didn't copy those. Again, these are my own slides. I must say that I had to take these in the archives myself just because it gets real expensive to take them out and have them done, as many of you know. So I apologize, the poor quality of some of these slides are my error and not anything else. Well, let's go on a minute. Um, these two also, Dan, you want to pull this apart just a little bit, please? These two I also have, they have Alger on the back. Now, it's my understanding that in 1930, Russell Alger passed away. And a few years later, Mrs. Alger decided to give the moorings as, I think it was the first in Art Institute, or gave it to the city, and built a second house up on Provencal Road. Okay, whatever you call That's okay, come on. I got you. I'm gross point. You folks know what's right. I'm just giving you some. I assume, this is one of those photos that says Alger on the back. I assume this is her home there. On Provencal. Yes, do people know? But then I am not sure. I think this is also at her home, but I'm not sure. Was this at? Was this in the uh, the Knot Garden? See, when we only have Alger, I'm I'm letting I'm going to leave these with Jean, so you can look at these. But these are some of the problems I had because I know there was also a pool. I'll show you a minute at the second home. And so when we just have Alger and no date on the back of these, it became real problematic. I assume this was the second home. This isn't even the worst one for this one. The, the Algiers are particularly problematic because she worked so long. These are drawings. Again, you see many of her clients almost invariably were Mrs. Russell Alger, the lady of the house. We have a date, 3130, so we know, uh, December 31st, so we know that was the second house. I'm sure that was after Mr. Russell had passed away, and, and Mary, and I believe was her name, was beginning to think about a second home and what Mrs. Shipman could do for her. These are drawings of that second house. And I'll show you this because there was a long sort of green space. This is a, a plan, which I took a photo of, plants. And then there's this pool. And there's this little garden pavilion at the end. Now, guess what I have in the drawings? I have, oh, this is just below that. This is her cutting garden. Just to show you again the variety of drawings we have. This is, there must have been a place, and I don't know whether this was, again, at the first garden. Well, this says 1930. This might was the She was giving different trellis styles for Mrs. Alger's consideration. You see, she was talking about a rose trellis on the wall, and those are the different options she gave her. So Marion could decide which one she liked. I assume that was still at the moorings, but I can't tell. But here we are below the, this uh, pavilion. Guess what? We have this view of the Alger's backyard. Where do you view there? Is this right? You believe me? Okay, you're gonna believe me. Okay, I hope it is. It's a, this said Alger on the back, so I assume this is the little pavilion with the pool at the end of the second house, second garden. Yes. Okay, this is it, but guess what? This is also in the collection with Alger on the back. And this is a little pavilion that looks like Platt could have designed. So is this the second pavilion? Or is that the second pavilion? I will leave these with G. And you folks have fun. But you can imagine a thousand miles away in Ithaca. No, it's not. In Ithaca, I had not a clue. So I said, let me bring those. Because somehow, one of these. I would almost guess this may have been it. Because it looks a little more domestic in scale. And I have the feeling Mrs. Alger was wanting something a little less grand, a little smaller. I have no idea what that second house. It could be twice the size of the moorings, for all I know. But my sense was she wanted a bit smaller of a site. You folks look at it. But anyway, these are the kinds of problems, I say, that we have in the archive as uh, we go through them there. What pavilion is the Alger Pavilion? I'll let you. And I don't know then what the other one is. You see, that's the problem if it has Alger on the back. So one of these may be in Mount Kisco. OK, as I say, she began working for the Stevens about the same time, I assume, uh, these are 1917. I assume, again, it's through the work of Charles Adams Platt, having done the home 
for the Stevenses in 1913. Uh, not special. Again, you can tell these are in Mrs. Shipman's hand. Not quite so nice, and I'm sure she would say that. She had Elizabeth Leonard Strang, as I said, her first assistant she hired in 1913. She was the Cornell grad and loved her very much, and she taught Mrs. Shipman quite a bit in terms of drawing and architectural rendering and so forth. But I think at this point, Mrs. Shipman realized this was not going to be what her office was about. She would have people doing her drawings and doing the drafting work. She was really the PR person. She was, uh, as I said, loved by everyone. In fact, Edith and Edgar Stern down Longview, which is probably one of her great gardens, called her Lady Ellen. And they just loved her, and she was almost a grandmother to their children. So she had that kind of relationship with most of her clients. Now, these aren't great drawings. I show those only because this is the kind of thing that you'll find in the archive. Quotes like that. Interestingly, these are for William H. Stevens, 1929. So that's one way she got clients. I assume that this is the son of Henry. And these are the drawings she was doing. And these are particularly interesting because she gets very concerned with this little sitting area right here. This is an elevation of that for the Stevens. And guess what else she does? I think this is the one. She actually draws what garden furniture Mrs. Stevens should use for that patio. So people really called up on her to do everything when she was designing these locations. So I don't know what she chose, but there's a whole sketchbook of these chairs and chases and so forth that Mrs. Stevens should use on that back patio. OK, let's see if I can do this without notes. OK, this is the McGraws. Um, if you get into the Garden Club of America, they had one of their annual meetings here in 1925, big meeting. And if you look at the bulletin, they talk about the gardens afterwards. And it's critical that you know that Mrs. McGraw had her garden done in 24. And so she was on the garden tour. And this is one of the few in 1925 at the garden tour that Mrs. Shipman had done that was on the tour. Uh, Dan says he knows where the house is. Does everybody know where this house is in town? OK. I don't know who. Anyway, it was uh, we have beautiful documentation. We have lots of drawings because this was featured in a house and garden article. I believe that's the periodical, one of the garden periodicals. And they allowed photograph photographers to come in and take lots of photographs, and we have all the drawings, as far as I know, in the Shipman collection. That's unusual. Most people who are well-to-do did not appreciate having their gardens published, to be honest. And so it was rare that Mrs. Shipman got a client that would just let someone come in and do the kind of photography that McGraw's allowed. And so this is why we have such wonderful photographs and documented. These are my photos, not great. I've got some others <laughs> copied. Um, a little about the design, if you don't know, it's basically at the back of the residence. This is the plan. We're going to go out into a courtyard, and then she goes into this wonderfully planted area. There's a bit of, I'm not sure what here. We'll go out, and there's a little gate here. And then the drawing is huge. It's almost like the Samuel Salvage drawing out in the exhibition. And they're actually in pieces I'm going to show you. That's why we have this fold. They had to fold the silly drawing in the collection to even get it in one of the folders. And I couldn't flatten it out when I was taking but I apologize. For it. But you see, you come out on this terrace, you sit down, and there's this wonderful little lead tank there that Mrs. Shipman, I think, had helped them acquire. And I thought that was really unique until I walked around Etzel Ford today, and I noticed they have a lead tank too. So maybe everybody had lead water tanks or something at that period. I don't know. This is, just to give you a sense, this is the uh, flower planting plan for this main garden. And we're going to see that in these photos. And you'll see how full and lush this is. And this, this is up on that terrace looking back. Way over here is the lead tank which is here. And you see how lush that is. Again, can you imagine what this was like in color? So here we have these beautiful black and white. Certainly we understand texture, and we understand the importance of shade and shadow and light in the garden. And that's what Mrs. Shipman was particularly concerned about. Again, as I said, we look here, we're over here, in this part of the garden, here's the gate. So we have another whole piece, um, and this is the walk through there. A lot of Shipman details here. Uh, this gate is one she uses often, so I assume she helped plan that whole garden wall enclosure. Uh, the pathways often vary. This is a little unusual, although this is common, and I, and I always laugh at that. It looks sort of tacky, 
but they'll stand pieces of slate on edge. But many people use that. It looks so temporary. But many of these elegant gardens have this sort of funny stuff on the edge. So you see that quite often. I don't know how that became. These are the end pieces of the drawings. Um, again, this is a thing Judith talks about, and I hadn't thought about it. It was really an interesting idea to me. Many of the drawings, and this would have been by someone like Elizabeth Leonard Strang. You see the beautiful handwork here. Often did these little vignettes, we call them, little views of what the garden would look like. And Judith argues, and I think she's correct, that many of uh, these gardens, or, or many of the drawings, actually began with women who decided to do these little pictures of what the garden would look like. So one understood from that earliest plan how the garden would evolve and develop. And she said that wasn't true, particularly of men, because they would make it much more architectural. They would be sections, all kinds of drawings. So this is an interesting innovation that uh, Ellen Shipman and her female draft people did. Again, two of the drawings for Mrs. McGraw. McGraw. You see Mrs. Theodore again. It was never Theodore. Uh, these are the, that's the upper terrace. And then this is the reserve or picking garden. I don't know where that was because we don't have a plan, a finished plan that shows that. Uh, but if anyone wanted to look at this property, we would have some of the best uh, documentation that we probably have in the collection. Again, these are two views of the front. So it was unfortunate that not everybody allowed their garden to be documented for a, a periodical because we have wonderful collection of early photos and so forth. This is a fun one. This is the uh, Barber, uh, Edwin Barber site. Again, you have to be careful. I noticed when I was reading in the... Uh, 1925 brochure and record of the annual garden of the garden club visit here they talked about the edwin barber garden mrs shipman didn't do this one until 1927. so i have to think barbers had one in 25 they weren't happy and when mrs shipman came and became so involved here in gross point they had her come and redesign their garden so that's another thing you have to be careful many of these gardens got redesigned several times by different people and so I don't know who did the garden before Mrs. Shipman. I do know this was the design she had for them in 1927. Just a couple interesting things. We have this long view, this long green piece. This is a service drive. Does anybody know, is this one still existing, or the house? Yeah, it's near oh, the state hall. The house. The house. Who, who lives there now? It's near St. Paul? St. Paul's on Oh, St. Paul. OK, so we know where it is. Anyway, you go back. This is a blueprint, obviously. We're going to see a planting plan for the perennial. This became real important. Mrs. Barber couldn't decide what to do there. So we're going to see how Mrs. Shipman helped walk her through that. And then this is a typical Shipman motif. She did what they call a wild garden. So she had this real interesting juxtaposition, we would say, from a very formal garden. Right next to it, you had this wonderful little wild path planted in all kinds of spring flowering, primulas and trillium and that kind of thing. So she often played with that. So people would come through a formal or vice versa, come through this one and then go back to another type of garden. These are drawings for that end piece. And they go up to F. This is A. This is, I think, C. See, they couldn't decide. And so she didn't tell Mrs. Barber what to do. She said, we could do this. And these are the in plan. And that's the little vignette. And finally, I was telling Dan, it looks like to me, this is the garden. It almost looks like it's transparent, that you actually can see the statue with the green behind it. But however, this is the end of the garden. We're now, this is the end with the little uh, alcove or whatever one would call it. You come up the steps, and so you're standing here and looking all the way back. You see, that's what we have identified as the barber home. Is this the barber house? <laughs> I'll tell you why. There's a view in one of the Garden Club of America bulletins that the house looks twice as tall and very grand. And I was looking at this, I said, that doesn't look like the picture in the Garden Club book. But these are got, they have Barber on the back, and it's a beautiful garden. And you see, the interesting thing is, oh, they, they certainly are, they are this garden right here. So the whole thing, it says, Mr. Edwin Scott Barber. So I don't know how else to, it's certainly the garden that matches those photos. But it's interesting, this time, whether this is so early and whether the house got renovated later, you know, it, it's tough to know. And these are the kind of things you folks can worry about. <laughs> this is the perennial plan. Again, I'm, I'm sorry I'm going so long here. And you see the whole list of plants. So if one wanted to redo that garden, 
you would have the whole list of uh, bulbs and perennials there one could have. This is Dr. Murray's, uh, I liked it, I didn't, Murphy, I didn't know this one at all, and remember we talked about, this is the Murphy house, looked out, remember the little funny things in the Morris Garden in Chestnut Hill? <laughs> she must have liked that most people because they get, and I assume she gave this to Dr. Murphy and his wife um, as a first idea. And remember, here she does say Dr. Murphy, here it's Dr. and Mrs. But what's interesting, in this very first drawing, if you, I don't know if you know where this house is, was, okay. This is the main terrace, you come down, come down. This was planted right here. And then it gets turned here, but see that? This right here is this piece. And you come down, and we're gonna see this. But it evolved from nothing into these wonderful curved steps. And we're gonna see the evolution of that. Here, for some reason, there was no connection from the terrace to the house. Here, we see this wonderful connection in terms of these drawings. Okay, this is a perennial planting bed for the garden to the left. This was the one on the left. This is the center. Here are the first drawings for the garden on the right. Everybody see how she began to make connections and said, well, this might be nice. The straight steps. And then she says, what about something like this that curves down and here, in fact, are the stairs that ended up on the house that's no longer there, I take it. Right. Was anybody ever there? Yeah. Yeah, were they like that? Yeah. Great. So I assume that she and the Murphys, this is true, uh, okay. I assume that she and the Murphys worked through that in terms of how those steps evolved. And again, you see here are the steps, here's the upper terrace, and then this must have been the view out to the lake as they set out on a park. Great, great side. I'm sorry, that one's gone. That would have been a beautiful one. Again, her office did all the working drawings, or these are construction drawings. Often they were drawn to scale. She would actually draw the size of a balustrade so you would understand what that actually would be like out of doors. So it was very clear for the client to see what she was doing. And this is the little niche at the Murphy's, and this is how she would start. A little, probably was she or one of the students, she said, okay, so they're beginning to work on this niche. Here it is, you see they've begun to do the detail. And now, this is another kicker. This is the niche, I forget that, right? Mm -hmm. This was also in the collection with Murphy on the back. Oh, but out here, I see it's got oh, Newberry. Yeah. So is this one of the new John Newberries? Yes. Yeah, okay. So that I've learned, but these were both, and I couldn't figure out, well, she would have had two. So this one was at the Murphy home. This one was a Newberry photo. I mean, we don't have any plans of the Newberries, unfortunately, so I couldn't check Even it. more interesting, the statue's in the middle of the pool at the, out, at the War Memorial. No. Oh, this one? Yeah. Yeah. This statue has now been preserved, you say. So yeah. it's there. So this was all removed. I take it to Newberry. Okay. So the statue's at the War Memorial. This, I don't know who got this statue. You don't know, because this is gone, right? That's gone. Okay. It's lost gross point, is what we call it. Okay. Again, we see the photos, and this is interesting because Dan can believe it. This is Mrs. Murphy's bedroom and sunroom. Again, Ellen Shipman was asked to lay out the furniture and the interior layout to show Mrs. Murphy how exactly to arrange her furniture. So again, she was appreciated for her multi-talented ability. I mean, she was just really an incredible woman. Um, these are three of Courtney Allington. I don't know much about the site. All I do is know that we have very poor documentation. Do people know where this garden is or was? That's on Provanto Road. Okay, everybody know that it's Allington. Uh, it was a small side garden. We're looking here. This is unusual. It's a very bad photo, but these are little photos. I found them myself. They're like brownie cameras. They're not professional, and that's why they're not the best quality. But there is some documentation. You see the wall. We're looking over the wall at this little water piece here. The, the plans are at the house. Oh, they're at the house. Well, we should have those at Cornell, John. <laughs> Why are you hanging on to those? At, at the Ford well, House. Because the current owner is working on res restoring or... Oh, uh, good luck. Okay, see, now he tells me. Okay. Well, anyway, there was an interesting, it looked like he came out, and sort of a strange, I don't know why the planting is sort of odd, the way they've got... This looks very new. You see, this small orchard has just been planted, and I don't know what backs up to that, whether the lake is out there, whether the lake's to our right. I don't have any orientation. But anyway, a very nice bench at the end, uh, interesting relationship to the plant. 
And finally, this is just a sort of nowhere photo, but she had several drawings of tea houses. This was the most interesting. So I wondered at one point if there was a tea house at the Allingtons that Mrs. Shipman designed. I don't know that. So I said, I only have drawings, no photos. Does anybody remember that? You don't have to tell us your age. Do you remember a tea house at the Allingtons? OK. I, I don't know, but there's some very nice drawings of the tea house. Oh, are people, if people need to get up, are you really getting tired? I'm sorry. We're, we're, this is gross point. You should like this. I apologize. I just can't shut up. Uh, this is Oscar Webers. Again, this is the one. I don't know much about Oscar Webers. I do know, um, yeah, is it Richard Weber you just have photos of? I didn't even know that she had done Richard Webers. We have no record of all at all of that at Cornell. So uh, this is the first one she did for Oscar. We're going to see this right here turned around. I think this was her first conceptual drawing, and then she ended up doing something different. But this is the wonderful kind of details uh, she did for the drawings there. Uh, here we've turned it around, and what's nice about this drawing, this is the lower part that Mr. Ops Webber, it's the Evergreen Garden. This is the image at the top, and isn't that really nice? She shows how we look out the house. Here's the, probably the dining room. Uh, you look at the little building, and then this is very intentionally all put with evergreen, so it would particularly have winter interest. So it, it's a very nice image of how she represented to Mr. and Mrs. Webber. Here I see it's Mr. Oscar, which is very unusual. Was there a Mrs.? Yes. Okay, so that's a very unusual thing. You note those sometimes. Here she did put Mr. Webber there. And these are the planting plants. Again, I don't know where this occurred, but we have another naturalistic stream garden. These were common part of her repertoire of, of involving, she really liked to mix garden styles this way. Very formal gardens as well as these very natural gardens. And this is what I was talking about with Mendelssohn. Again, we don't have any more folks hanging in there. Uh, this is the drawing by this gentleman, E. A. Eichstock, landscape architect. And there are 10 or 12 of those in the collection. And I don't know the gentleman. He may have a collection. And if anybody knows that people are trying to find his drawings, we have these. He might have done this. Mendelssohn didn't like his work, and so they went to Mrs. Shipman. You'll notice we've switched. This is here. So this is the garden Mrs. Shipman designs. It gets turned up. She does a design for the front, which is rather interesting, and then we're going to see a perennial planting plan for this. Does anybody know if this house is still existing? No. Oh, it is? No. John, they say no. It is. You're outvoted. He says yes. You guys fight it out. All right, this is the entry. This is Lewis Mendelssohn. And then this is part of the perennial planting plant in that interior garden. Again, I didn't, I had never heard or seen this garden, so it looks like an interesting one if there were further documentation. Probably the most famous one is Rose Terrace. Um, I won't say much about it because there's some good drawings out there. I'll only say that this was Anna Dodge, right? Anna Dillman, then became Mrs. Horace Dodge or Anna Dodge. This was the house, as I understand it, the country club was actually located on part of the property. She tore down the old Rose Terrace, tore down the country club, built a new Rose Terrace, and then had Mr. Shipman do these gardens. One of the interesting things, we'll go out, this is this garden right here. You see the scale of that with the statuary and the large green sward here. We're going to go through a couple views here. What's interesting is this must be, and, I, and you don't know that by the documentation, this must be an early drawing, because we're going to see finally that you get a very large casino here, and the pool will actually be oriented this way. <laughs> so it's interesting that that was an early plan. It gives us a good idea of the layout, but not uh, a perfect. This is some views of the clipped walks. We go through, there's a pool, and then you go left out to uh, Lake St. Clair. This is that view out. You see down, then go down another. This is where we get hit balustrade, and you see here's the casino. She put a lot of drawing, and here the pool, and then the lake is right beyond that. Beautiful, beautiful. It's unfortunate that this is gone, obviously. And you have some wonderful photos also that I see Cornell doesn't have. I was telling John we need to check and get these. But again, all the drawings, you see these casino drawings, it's this little thing, I'm sure it gets much enlarged there. Drawings for an entry. I don't know if this ever was put in place. Does anybody remember this entry at Rose Terrace? Uh, we have several drawings. This is the plan. No more information on that except that it was one of the Dillman drawings. <coughs> oh, and real quickly, we're moving along here. Hang in, folks. Uh, this is Lakeshore Road, as I was told. Mrs. Shipman also put drive down, so she had it wrong, but uh, Jean tells me it is officially the road. And Mrs. Shipman, I don't know how, and Jean's going to pursue it, somehow in 32 was asked, 
to do the planting. And the reason I say I don't know how is it's so unusual for a woman to have a public commission of this type. And I assume because she was so well known to the city fathers, that was the reason. That may not be true. I don't even know who was in control of this, whether it was county, one of the municipalities, whomever. Anyway, she did an interesting. This is simply one of the drawings. There are 47 of these. So if you want to come and have 47 of these drawings, what's fascinating, uh, all of these up here, the, the, she locates property. It's the who's who of Gross Point in 1932. The McGraws, the Newberries, you know, the Dodges, who's ever along there. So the names are incredible when you go along that. But this is the survey, which I think you actually have. So she used this. The planting plant, as somebody noted, was unique in the sense that it had a lot of willows and uh, crab or, or flowering crabs. I don't know if it's been replaced. One of the things that I see you're still doing, most of these, I don't know what you call these, the cuts in the boulevard, she actually planted here so you didn't look out on the lake. Yeah. And I see that's been maintained somewhat. There are a few evergreens as I drove along today. But that was one of her concepts. You sort of enclosed these cut areas, and then you left the openings, and then again the next cut, which would be a pretty easy motif. So it also hid the view of people driving and, and cutting through those. OK, we're at McNaughton's, and we're going to move real quick. I promise. This was her idea for McNaughton's. Anybody know where this one is? Yeah, Kenwood Road. OK, everybody know where Kenwood Road? This is who lives there now, John? OK. I think this was her idea, really big time. I think this is what actually got installed, a much simpler, uh, still a very nice plan. Uh, again, I know very little about the McNaughton's uh, in terms of their uh, information available. These are a couple planting plans that she did for Mrs. McNaughton. Again, typical of the many, many kind of plans she did. Uh, the reason I show this, this is that long green piece with the pool. These are her plantings. But all of these also had notes. So if any of you are horticultural kind of uh, have interest, she told people how to stake, how to fertilize, how to prepare soil. She was the ultimate horticulturalist. So she gave, you know, she required that you have a gardener, and then she told him what to do. So she was really a very good. OK, this is the big debate of tonight. This is going to be the door prize. Uh, everybody says, this is not the Lord home. This is John Lord's garden. And everybody's convinced this is not it. We don't think it's the one out there. But let me show you what's hard for me to understand. I think the photo was inverted out there. Because the plan, yeah, this I think works. Because follow me, this is the front of the Lord house. And this is the back. Everybody see this bowed window and the way it goes in, out, in. OK. This is the plant. You see it's in, out, in. Here's the bowed window. So for whatever reason, these plans are the plans for this house. I don't know whose house it is. She says it's Mr. and Mrs. John Lord. But they fit this house. and so. This is just a little drawing, but let me show you. This is really interesting. I think Mrs. Shipman did this garden, and she did this garden. I wonder if some of them were already there. I'm not sure she put this hedge in, because I don't have any plans for that. This little box. Also, the tea house never happened. She has tea house, tea house. It never happens, because here is the first drawing. We see tea house. The tea house didn't happen at all. It became a statue. Also, she did this very funny thing. It's what we call a forced perspective. Uh, because of the alignment, it makes it look farther away than it is. It's a way to aggrandize your garden. It actually looks farther. And what's amazing to me is one of her least favorite plants is the blue spruce. She hates it. She said, Colorado blue spruce are great in the mountains of Colorado. And that's it. And these, I think, are all blue spruce. So I wonder if they were there. She must have been horrified because she hated them. And they're there. But anyway, this also fits that garden, John. So this is a real kicker. This is that second garden. You see the little pool. Again, her informal plantings here. You can see the water. Uh, and again, it fits that house. So uh, do they give us street address? Uh, oh, come on. You don't get that lucky. You don't get that lucky. It just says gross point. You're supposed to know. OK, these are a couple of the new berries. I was told this is actually, I think, Truman's house looking at John or something. But we have very little new berry. I don't know why. We just don't have it. So I wonder if the family had it. Or uh, again, we don't have any drawings for the Murray Sales. This is the sales home. Uh, you've all seen these. There are photos out there. Not a drawing. So I don't know what happened if the sales had these and kept them. 
uh, beautiful. They were in a, in a periodical. I mean, they published some information on them. We don't have a drawing of the new berries or sales, and there are others we don't have. So, and these are photos of the sales in back. They're the same photos. As. All right, I think we're done. What I was going to do is end up with a few pictures of John's place. This is Stan Hewitt, it's no longer, but to show you what a garden might look like today, to give you a little color here at the end, uh, a beautiful, uh, I think, uh, renovation or restoration, huh? whatever word you want to use, there are lots of terms that we go through. I think the green and the shadow and, and light is what I really like, the way that it pops out at the Stan Hewitt site, and uh, the wonderful uh, use of the mature plant material plus new plant material. It's just really exciting to see this happen, and whether it's an actual uh, copy or duplicate, it certainly, I think, has the qualities that Mrs. Shipman would uh, admire in her garden. So I end with this. One thing that I was so fascinated when I actually visited her birth, well, her home and then her uh, tombstone, I have never seen anybody else put this on their tombstone. And I hope that she probably thought that because she saw herself as really the consummate designer landscape architect. And so uh, I think you're very lucky to have had this special person, this special designer, do so much work, even though we don't know all of it and we haven't got it well documented. Certainly, Gross Point was uh, lucky to have had her here. Okay. Apologize for going over. Thank you so much. I will stay around for the questions.